physical and immunological barriers at mucosal surfaces to invade tissues and then how they evade systemic immune responses to establish a niche for replication. Jason's current work focuses on malaria as a risk factor for invasive bacterial diseases, specifically the role of co-infection in the loss of intestinal integrity and the disruption of neutrophil mediated contaminant of salmonella. This research has led to work in animal models and clinical cohorts. After his PhD in immunology from the University of California, Davis in 2015, Jason moved to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine to work with Professor Eleanor Riley and then moved to the University of Edinburgh in 2017. Jason currently works as a core scientist at the University of Infection and Immunity Research, my alma mater, within the School of Biological Sciences. As I said last time, if you've got any questions, can you drop them into the chat or into the Q&A box? All right, can everyone hear me now? All right, I think I know. Um, is it possible to share video and uh, share screen? Uh, you should be able to. You're a panelist. Give me one second. I'll upgrade you to a co-host because sometimes that makes things easier. <laughs> oh, there. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Video. Share screen. Oh, we're getting there. One. Just bear with me for a second getting this together. Screen, screen, screen. There we go, I can see it. There we go, let's just swap these out of the way. All this new technology, okay, laser pointer. All right, thanks for that kind introduction, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Jason. I'm gonna tell you today about uh, my interest in uh, understanding malaria and salmonella co-infection. So I actually have to give a um, short 20 minute seminar in a couple of days for um, Chancellor's Fellowship application that I applied to here at Edinburgh. So it's, this talk is very focused uh, to both non-experts and uh, undergrads and also focuses a lot on the University of Edinburgh and my time of what I've done since here. So bear with me that it's not too technical for immunology. So, uh, what my research has involved is understanding uh, sepsis. Um, so it's a big public health problem, both locally and globally. So here in Scotland, thinking locally, one death every four hours can be attributed to sepsis. So sepsis is a dysregulated host response to infection, um, often uh, caused by invasive bacterial uh, invasive bacteria. Uh, world, looking worldwide, uh, there's about six million deaths per year, and can, this can disproportionately impact. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So in a recent um, analysis in the Lancet, uh, the deaths related to the sepsis can reach uh, almost 65%, so quite high. And one of those causes of sepsis in, in Sub-Saharan Africa is non-typhoidal serotypes of salmonella, gram-negative bacterium. So in a healthy individual like you and I uh, would, would cause uh, inflammatory diarrhea, and individuals who are immune compromised can come down with the systemic disease. And so uh, invasive is, is, is often called invasive NTS disease rather than the, the quite benign inflammatory diarrhea you and I might see. There's about a million cases per year in Sub-Saharan Africa and has about a 20% case fatality rate. And so one of those immune, uh, immune compromising conditions is uh, malaria caused by the parasite plasmodium uh, and, and still have a high burden in the world 219 million cases per year and almost half a million deaths. So here's just a spatial distribution of invasive NTS, a high burden in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and also uh, Plasmodium falciparum, so the more severe uh, species of Plasmodium in the world. And so in one area, you can have many different pathogens co-circulating, and in, in fact, in individuals, you can have those pathogens together, and we call this just a co-infection. And so uh, the co-infection and, and co- um, association of malaria and salmonella has been known for over a hundred years, even back down to the American Civil War, so quite long. And so here's just one recent epidemiologic study showing that 
in a community if you in Tanzania, if you can reduce malaria in, in the community, you can also reduce all cause bacteremia, including invasive NTS. And so individuals that might come to the clinic who have bacteria present in their blood and also malaria, so bacteria in the blood is called bacteremia, the most common isolate from that is this non-typhoidal serotype salmonella. And so really my interest has been uh, since my PhD and kind of uh, wanting to go forward is really to understand that underlying mechanism of how malaria increases this risk of invasive NTS. And so to, to do that, I kind of think of the, the gaps in knowledge of where we are as a field of uh, when we encounter uh, this, uh, this bacterium through contaminated food or contaminated water. Uh, I, I usually think about this in three different themes. Uh, colonization of bacteria in the intestinal lumen, its translocation dissemination to, to systemic sites, such as the liver and spleen, um, and then this, the lack of containment by immune cells uh, leading to uh, the presence of bacteria in the blood, so the bacteremia. And if you're interested in the, the, the mechanistic um, immunological basis of this that we know and more of the gaps specifically in knowledge that I won't cover today, I, I just point you to a recent review. So again, I studied this uh, during my PhD at UC Davis in macaque models and, and animal models. And after a short time working on influenza infection and in role of NK cells, um, I kind of got my wish to go back and looking um, in, at a human field study in the Gambia. But what I want to talk to you today is a little bit of data upon each of these kind of themes and mostly focusing on data from the animal model and specifically on data that's been generated mostly uh, by Edinburgh students. And so the ultimate goal of this research really is to take this current work uh, and build upon it for future field studies and develop hopefully new interventions to reduce death to invasive salmonella. So, all right, so going back in, back in time, um, so to my PhD, what I did was I was using some animal models, co-infection where I administered uh, Plasmodium ulei nigeriensis, so rodent malaria, which causes an, a, an acute severe malaria infection, and then challenged with Salmonella typhimurium. So this is just parasite burden over time after you give malaria by IP inoculation. So this is just parasitemia. And so you get a high parasitemia of around 20, 25%, 10 days post challenge. And then at this time point, I would administer Salmonella by oral cabbage. And you could look at two days later and look at the cecum of the intestine uh, for inflammations and, for example, pathology. Uh, so if the mice are allowed to go another two days, we reach the humane endpoint, which was around 20% weight loss with co-infection. The question I was asking here at this time point was, you know, looking at the single infection of salmonella or with underlying malaria, where you get this hepatomegaly and this, this uh, uh, very dark pigment, which is hemozoan, the breakdown product of heme by malaria, do we see a difference in the number of bacteria in that organ? And so that's this data here. So here on the left, we have what the mouse cecum looks like, either mock infected, malaria infected, with salmonella alone or co-infected. So just in the gross pathology, you can see that salmonella is very different. It's devoid of contents and it's very white. And then with the H&E section, uh, you can see uh, a lot of edema and swelling within salmonella alone, so this is known. But what was different was that you saw a decrease in this inflammatory uh, pathology with co-infection. So specifically, we saw a decrease in neutrophils in the tissue. And I'll just point quickly first is that while we don't appreciate a difference here with malaria, I'll, I'll come back to that later. But for now, let's zooming out to what happens more systemically. Uh, and, and in terms of bacteria present in the liver, uh, normalized to the gram of tissue, don't really see anything early on, but at two days post uh, salmonella inoculation, you start to see an increase in the number of bacteria in, in, in mice that had malaria. And then this dramatically increased to about four logs uh, difference between single infection. And so with this model, we were able to see reduced intestinal response, or specifically response to salmonella, and increase systemic bacteria. And so if you take that uh, more systemic phenotype of um, increased systemic growth uh, in the liver, spleen, or even the blood, 
um, what we described previously was that there was a decrease in immune cell migration into the liver as well. And uh, neutrophils that were there had um, re re reduced um, production of reactive oxygen species. And so two main factors that malaria contributes to this dysfunction is one hemolysis. So this is the lysis of red blood cells due to parasite growth. And the other one would be the regulation of inflammation through the immunoregulatory cytokine IL-10. So both of these helped to converge to influence and, and contribute to bacteremia. And, but there's several different gaps of what we understand now, uh, right? So we know neutrophils are multifunctional, both in their, their role for phagocytosis, degranulation, migration, mitosis. And we just kind of described one of those, which is reactive oxygen species. And so we really don't know how neutrophils really function with malaria infection. And then more importantly, we don't know how to restore function to just administering inhibitors for IL-10 um, receptor or to block uh, heme oxygenase one wasn't sufficient to really um, restore um, function uh, and, and keep uh, growth down to a, to a measurable level. So, um, <clears throat> so, so gaps, gaps left to fill in that area. And then just going kind of looking ahead, of what happens when salmonella is taken up um, and what happens at the level of the gut. Um, so malaria itself, uh, so I was the first to describe in 2015 that malaria can cause dysbiosis of the microbiota. And this dysbiosis was important for this increase in salmonella colonization. And um, so I was able to show that through a fecal oral transplant experiment through germ-free mice. Um, but Beyond knowing that dysbiosis occurs, and now other groups have now shown this, we don't know the mechanism of this dysbiosis. And in particular, we don't know if this the dysbiosis, which occurs in, in animal models, whether this occurs in humans. And I think this is, was really an interesting um, question for that I've always had is, what is malaria doing? So uh, we, the WHO reports diarrhea as a symptom of malaria as well. Granted, it might not be the same as of salmonella. So, so, so what is this, what is this um, pathology that, that, that's occurring? Um, you know, what, what's malaria doing in the gut? So we understand malaria as uh, giving fever and anemia, and, and what's less appreciated in the field is any role in GI pathology. So uh, what kind of data is out there already about malaria inducing a response or changing in the gut? So from some case reports of children that sadly succumb to infection, um, uh, some researchers have looked for parasites in many different tissues. And one of those that they noted was parasites are present in the small intestines, although it's very difficult for me to, to see anything in, in these papers. And then myself and others have shown that there isn't, a, 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 while not, of course, not the degree that you see with salmonella, you do see some pathology in malaria infection in mice. And so my question has been um, kind of based on understanding how malaria induces this response. Is it mainly driven through a systemic response to infection, systemic, like increase in systemic inflammation, or is this more of a local response? And I can kind of put my weight on uh, my hypothesis being that really it's driven by parasites present in the tissue creating a local response. And this really isn't a, a big stretch of the imagination for me because we know for the syndrome of malaria and with cerebral malaria, that parasites, part of their growth can sequester in the tissue. And, and at least in the brain, in some individuals, this can cause uh, localized inflammation and vascular occlusion and hypoxia. So the parasites can uh, under, undergo this um, feature called rosetting and this rosetting can have the adherence of parasites to the vascular endothelial wall. So really, Basic, I'm just asking, does this sequestration and pathology also occur in the intestine? And to do that, sadly, I can't go back to my model that I used at UC Davis uh, using ULAI Nigeriensis, mostly because this is an acute severe malaria infection. And what we really want to do is model um, P. falciparum, at least as best as we can, right? So where there is a high parasitemia of 25% in P. ULAI Nigeriensis and the serial blood massage. Parasites and, and humans, we don't see hyperparasitemia, uh, which is at more than 5%. It's often very, very low. Uh, 
and further, it doesn't. This strain doesn't necessarily uh, cause sequestration, so it's an asynchronous strain. So falciparum is synchronous, so you'll get a fever every uh, two days, and during that um, asexual replication, it is in tissues. Um, so we're trying to look for a better model. And when I came to Edinburgh, some some researchers have already found some found a, a better model for uh, malaria in mice. So this is Osmodium shibati strain AS. So what Phil Spence did was he passaged the parasites through, through its natural vector mosquitoes. And what that did was change its, uh, its um, uh, gene repertoire of what it was expressing. Um, so essentially before we were, had blood adapted parasites. So doing this kind of reset the genetic profile epigenetically and the parasites were attenuated and we had a very low parasitemia. And importantly, we still saw, even with the low parasitemia, persistent anemia. And Joanne Thompson, um, a malaria geneticist, was able to create some marker-free um, fluorescent parasites, either with GFP, MCRI, or even now with an MK2, which is far red. So really lending itself to some in vivo imaging. And then specifically, Phil was able to show that this strain sequestered in some tissues, uh, but it wasn't really described whether the strain could sequester in the intestine, so that wasn't known. So we have this new model. Um, okay, so I can ask my question, is, is there any relevance to the intestine? And so I'm borrowing some in, uh, what's known in the IDD field of looking at secretory uh, immunoglobulin A and feces over time. So Tom Oldfield, an immunology student at Edinburgh undergrad, was looking at fecal pellets collected of the same animals over time and saw an increase in secretory IgA at day seven and day eight post inoculation. So it's really nice that we can see markers of inflammation uh, without having um, uh, to, to do any invasive work. That really lends itself to potentially being applicable to humans. And next, we looked at the intestinal tissue. Uh, uh, by qrt pcr looking for markers of interferon gamma and calprotectin, and this was increased at seven days post-inoculation. And there didn't seem to be any tropism to the small intestine or large intestine, it seemed to be throughout, uh, which is qu uh, quite interesting. Um, so yes, so there's, there's some inflammation markers in feces and in tissue. And so something I'm more comfortable with is flow cytometry. And similarly to what I saw in the OAI model, um, I was starting to see an increase in monocytes, specifically lysis C positive cells. Uh, again, this is, was just a one pilot experiment by Rivka, a master's student. Uh, but interestingly, I was hypothesizing that I, I would see increased um, inflammatory monocytes, lysis C high, but they tended to be lysis C low. So uh, depending on where they're spatially located, um, that's potentially indicating some tissue injury occurring. But really to get at that um, uh, pathology, we need to actually visual, visualize the tissue. So I've been creating those Swiss rolls of the tissue. So taking intestine, rolling them in formula and fixing them. And so this alcyon blue stained one, you could look uh, for pathology and, and one of our uh, TIVA fellows from, from Edinburgh, Ajoke, who's a, a professor in Nigeria, she was measuring villus height to crypt depth. And this ratio is, and can indicate inflammation. Uh, and there is, and so in a blinded fashion of over 300 of these paired markers at day seven, we saw a difference and a reduction in this ratio, indicating that there may in fact be some pathology in this model as well. Uh, but, you know, is, is there's inflammation, there's pathology, are parasites even in the tissue? And so Sophia Donvito and Leah Pickles, uh, two students, we're doing immunohistochemistry to tagging that GFP marker. And uh, you were able, to, uh, Sophia was able to show parasites uh, within defined blood vessels, just blown up here, and also interestingly up against the vascular endothelial wall. So really showing that for the first time in, in animals that uh, this malaria parasite can actually sequester. And Leah had some really great photos of, of more parasites up in the villus tips, but of course her work was um, pause due to COVID. Um, so, but it was really exciting that we do see parasites throughout the whole of the intestine and they do actually sequester. Uh, 
And so the next step of this is really looking at the co-localization of all these features uh, using advanced microscopy, such as confocal. So here we just have an example of parasites present in, in the intestine near some interfering gamma producing cell. And then this was mostly um, helped by someone at the Rosalind Institute here in Edinburgh, Neil Mattern. And so now that we have this great new model, you know, we still need to, to, to fill this gap of knowledge. Can we link parasites to this immunopathology and really understand where the consequences of malaria in the gut? So, and this just gets to the point that, you know, what is malaria doing and the impact and of, of intestinal health? Yes, yes, we're looking for impact on in infection, but also you can think of uh, impact for nutritional absorption or the gut brain axis, or even down to patient lifestyle. Uh, and so really intestinal health might be important for this population of 219 million people experiencing malaria. And, you know, how can, you know, we're not trying to cure mouse malaria, we're trying to look at human malaria. And so what we want to do is translate these findings from animals to, to mice. And so what I'd like to do going forward is, is looking at feces for, for signatures of inflammation, uh, pairing this with um, immune cell function and markers that lead to risk factors for invasive MTS. And what's really interesting is that, at least to me, if you look at those that come and come to the clinic and report diarrhea and complain of diarrhea, they, uh, a quarter of them actually have underlying malaria. So there, there, to me, that means beyond just invasive NTS, there is some association between uh, these, the clinical feature of diarrhea and malaria. And so to really ask this question, who, you know, who is experiencing diarrhea with malaria, you know, it's such a basic question you think would, would be known. This year during lockdown, we did a systematic review. So this was with Ida Say, a, a, another student here in Edinburgh. And this was just published last week at uh, on World Toilet Day of all days. So what we can conclude from looking at over 2000 papers is <laughs> data is not really consistent. So um, we weren't able to pull apart any consistent information a bit about age, sex, or species, or even people uh, defining what diarrhea was. And so coming in 2021, we're, we're really gonna look at raw clinical data to get the patient level to understand who might be presenting. But overall, you know, 11% of those with malaria might uh, complain of diarrhea. And to, to, to do, to, to, to wrap this up, you know, their goal is to reduce morbidity and mortality of salmonella infection. And, you know, we need to start thinking of targeted treatments, uh, whether mass drug administration or targeted prophylaxis. And to do that, we need to understand the underlying biology. And so I like to think sometimes at the clinic of the future, we need to go beyond just giving an antimalarial. We might need to give a probiotic or even an immunotherapy. So with that, um, I'd like to thank Professor Riley uh, and then also Eleanor, uh, uh, Joanne Thompson and uh, Phil Spence and then everybody at the MRC Research Unit in the Gambia and collaborators. So with that, I can take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much for a lovely talk. Um, We'll give people a couple of seconds to get their questions in, if people have any. <laughs> you just stop share, sharing if it's okay. <laughs> That's absolutely fine. Um, so um, I have one where you were talking about um, the, you were expecting to see a shift to the more inflammatory um, monocytes rather than the sort of i always i always get l y c six yeah no 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 i six g i six c it used to be g r one back in the day i'm like can immunologists stop changing the names of things <laughs> um with them being um six sort of medium they looked on the histogram yeah. and that's associated with less inflammation do you think that the injury to the mucosal membrane is inducing sort of immunosuppression that then allows bacteria to take a hold or is it physical injury that's causing pathogenic infections? No, no, it's, it's, it's a really good question. Um, so yeah, so the mechanism of, of injury, we don't know. So I like to 
I, I, I would love to understand if there's increased um, membrane permeability. So is there just a leaky gut essentially? Or the alternative is that immune cells are now active in that tissue and become susceptible to infection. So, right, we know in the intestine that dendritic cells are always sampling what's out in the environment. And if you get a pathogen that is very good at surviving intracellularly in a phagosome like salmonella, can it take hold and really overcome the defenses because the body you know, is, is driven into an immunoregulatory way? So in, in some ways, we, it's a great question, but we don't know which of those two arms might be occurring. And that's something that I'd like to hopefully do in the future. So. That's great. Um, Adam Kim has asked, um, I'm so sorry if I missed this, but have you looked to see if malaria leads to increased peripheral endotoxin? Um, so no, I haven't. Um, what I have looked, well, what I have looked for was um, uh, uh, 16S uh, in organs, and I have seen increased 16S. And also um, I have looked for LPS binding protein in sera. Um, but I don't necessarily um, don't necessarily like to look for increased LPS in, in plasma. What, um, what I'm doing in a couple of weeks is the fitzidextrin permeability assay. So that's using a fluorescent sugar. Um, another way you can do it is uh, lactulose mannitol ratios, another sugar. Um, but uh, no, I, I haven't specifically looked at endotoxin. Um, uh, just uh, I have looked for just bacteria, um, but yeah, TBD on whether there's increased membrane. <laughs> um, so uh, Georgia Barona White has asked, do you see any bacteria aggregating at the site of intestinal parasitesis either during co-infection or normal conditions? Sorry, sorry. Can you see bacteria aggregating at the site of intestinal parasites? Um, I haven't looked. Um, so mostly what we see is, are the parasites present um, within blood vessels or even capillary beds. Um, I don't necessarily have not stained for, uh, and you can usually see it in H&E. You don't necessarily see all bacteria present within that mucosal tissue. Um, so, so I guess the short answer would be no. Bill, uh, oh, and okay. a small <laughs> follow-up question is um, when you're looking at inflammation and immune responses, are they hyper-localized around the parasites or are they generalized across the whole gut? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I don't know, and I would love to answer that. And I think what would be, so what I'm trying to do now is hone, on, hone in on the right right gut, uh, right intestinal tissue, right? So small intestine, large intestine, large gut healing, and really what time point. And that now that we have this model, we can hopefully use in vivo imaging to look across the gut uh, in, a, in a more, you know, um, targeted way to really understand, you know, is it, is it general where the parasites are or is this just everywhere? Or are the parasites everywhere and this inflammation is everywhere? But, you know, yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Uh, and Adam, Adam said, um, can, I, can I also try fecal albumin? Yes, yes, I can try fecal albumin. Also, um, fecal caprotectin would be another great protein to look for. So thanks for reiterating the stuff to do. That's great. That's great. Thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Um, thanks for letting me practice this. So Monday morning, I, I got to give it for realsies too. Well, good luck with it. I'm sure okay, you'll so do much. great. I don't. I did immunobiology malaria as part of my honors program in oh, great. Edinburgh, and it was. Um, I'll tell you a secret. David Kavanagh, we called him Big Dave. Oh, okay. Because you've also got Wee Dave, David Gray, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. they both taught on the same course. <laughs> so as to differentiate them apart, I'm sure you'll do fantastic and good luck. All right, thank you um, guys so much for your time. The same as the previous speaker, if you have Twitter or social media, could you drop it into the chat so people can go and follow you? All right. Thanks, everyone. Perfect. OK, so our last speaker for today is Victoria Kate Heath from Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. I'm going to preface this with I did not write this biography because I am not this funny. <laughs> OK, so Kip has been a healthcare scientist in the NHS since she was 18.
which is either a comment on her commitment or her inability to move on. She specialised in both virology and immunology because she always has been incapable of making life decisions and is currently working as a deputy lead healthcare scientist for a London hospital. As she never learned how to say no, Kip not only has her main job, but also is lead ambassador for life science apprenticeships nationally, a STEM ambassador, an enterprise advisor in both London and Oxfordshire, and is passionate enough about science communication that she also has a side job in stand-up comedy. Despite being so terrified of public speaking that the first time she nearly tripped backwards down a flight of stairs to land in a converted jail cell. It's not going to lie, I laughed the first time I read this and I got emailed it. <laughs> um, on you go. Again, I'll reiterate, if you have any questions during Kip's talk, please pop them into the Q&A box or the chat. Ta. Hi everyone. So I'm going to start this talk by pointing out that it is not anything like as technical as everyone else. So I apologise in advance <laughs> for that. So I am here to talk about diagnostic immunology and healthcare science, which is something I'm really passionate about to the point where I fall downstairs uh, in converted magistrates courts. So what is healthcare science as opposed to more of a research-based science? So healthcare scientists use STEM subjects and computer programming to diagnose, treat and prevent disease and injury in patients. And we sit across four main areas, life sciences, which is where immunology sits, physiological sciences, medical physics and clinical engineering and bioinformatics. The commonly stated percentage is that we are responsible for 80% of the diagnosis made on the NHS. And normally we say that a billion tests are carried out every year, but remember that we are carrying out most of the COVID testing as well as the COVID antibody testing. So that number is probably much higher this year. We make up 5% of the NHS workforce and there are over 50,000 of us in England alone. And we have over 50 specialisms. So yes, in doubt, if in doubt, the uh, statistic does begin with a five. So I work at Great Ormond Street as deputy lead scientist. And I will also put, say that um, this is not on my research because my research is in drug resistance and refining the sepsis diagnosis pathway, which is more microbiology. And research is a really important part of diagnostic care. So my research is looking at reducing the diagnostic pathway for sepsis from 48 hours down to eight hours, which will hopefully improve patient outcomes. But actually we do a lot more of the bulk tests day in, day out. And comparatively to research, rather than knowing a huge amount about a relatively small area, you need to have a basic understanding of actually quite a large section of healthcare. Um, in my normal career spiel, so we have a really multidisciplinary team. We take scientific roles of medical laboratory assistants and associate practitioners who will support laboratory testing and who require no form of mandatory registration and in some cases not even anything further than A-level so we can train people up and put them through apprenticeships. We have two types of main scientific role, both of whom are registered with the Healthcare Professionals Council and this is statutory regulated within the UK. So clinical scientists and biomedical scientists are the only scientists who are permitted to release medical results within the UK. And then we also have our medical colleagues. So you can be, you can specialize within medicine and pathology and then within clinical immunology. This is a pre-COVID uh, photo of the clinical immunology lab at Great Ormond Street. And clinical immunology laboratory is particularly one that is as specialized as we are at GOSH, where we are a tertiary center, cover a huge area. So we will test allergy, auto, any, autoimmune conditions, both systemic and organ specific, hematological malignancies, such as myeloma, and in certain cases, leukemia as well. Immunochemistry, so we do a lot of immune status testing, antibody testing, that very small blue analyzer at the back of that photo of the lab is where all of our antibody testing is going through. Uh, immunodeficiencies, so both primary and secondary. Neuroimmunology, which is a very specialist area, and also any patients who are having transplants. So it is, for such a small discipline, it is quite wide. 
So I'm just going to talk a little bit about allergy and autoimmunity and immunodeficiency with an example of what might happen for one particular test. So allergy is a really ever increasing area, particularly in uh, developed countries. So mostly in the UK, North America, Japan and Europe, particularly Western Europe. In the UK, it's now estimated that a third of the population will experience allergic symptoms during their lifetime. And these numbers and the number of samples we are processing is going up and up and up. There's a very large spectrum of allergic diseases from asthma, rhinitis, conjunctivitis. And for allergy, actually clinical diagnosis and is possibly even more important than laboratory diagnosis. So what we've got here is a photo of a skin prick test, which is still the gold standard for allergy testing but it's potentially dangerous because you are injecting patients with histamine, so it carries an anaphylactic risk. And even if the patient isn't positive to many things, you can see there's some nice little wheels on the patient's arm, which it's not a particularly pleasant for the patient. So there is a preference for laboratory testing. However, sometimes this can be quite useful if patients need physical proof of their tests either way. From a clinical laboratory, we would use a large analyzer. So this is an Immunocap 250, which is my baby from when I used to work in uh, an immunology lab. They're often disguised as rest tests by clinicians, which is a radio allergisorbent test. We no longer do those. We haven't in at least 15 years, but the name has stuck. Uh, we don't we do still do radioactive testing within the NHS, but we try and reduce it where possible. And the RAS test is kind of outdated. So most of what we do is specific IgE antibody testing, which is very, is very similar to an ELISA, but the issue we have compared to an ELISA anti-testing is that IgE doesn't circulate in the blood in high enough quantities to be detected against the wells of an ELISA plate. So we use what we call an allergen cap, so rather than using a singular well from an ELISA plate, we will use a matrix to massively increase the surface area. And then we do it on an analyzer like this so we can compare lots and lots and lots of different allergens rather than just one at a time. It's a massively important for clinical history at this point because we get it's not unusual to get a request for a patient with about 30 or 40 different uh, allergens on it, which is not helpful because these aren't clinically quite as useful as some other tests that we do. And we also, we will measure total IgE because total Ig, a high level of total IgE circulating in the patient's blood may actually cause us a false positive on your specific IgE. And a total IgE level is actually useful for a whole collection of non-allergic diseases. So it can be an indicator of parasitic infection. It can be an indicator of certain types of immunodeficiencies such as hyper IgE syndrome or IgE mediated myeloma. And there is an increase in total IgE in a number of cases of vasculitis. And then the only thing we do in immunology that really counts as particularly urgent is mast cell tryptase. So in anaphylaxis, you have all the granulation of the mast cell tryptase in the blood, and we will look at tryptase levels at the time, and then 12 hours, 24 hours, and 48 hours later, so we can give an idea of uh, the seriousness of the anaphylaxis. So the major area in diagnostic immunology is autoimmunity. I'm not going to list off every single autoimmune condition that you may ever actually come across, but we will look for, particularly for so rheumatological diseases. So unlike in-house, in my history, it quite often was lupus. So we would do generally auto indirect immunofluorescence. So we would be looking at using patient sera, washing it against various cells or tissue to see whether or not we've got 
green down a microscope. Huge amount of immunology is looking for green down a microscope. Particularly, and then most of these, because indirect immunofluorescence is very sensitive, but not particularly specific, we would then follow it up with an ELISA antibody test or some kind of blot. We look for good partial syndrome or anti-GBM disease and Bergner's granulomatous. So what we have in the picture here are anti neutrophil cytoplasms make antibodies. So we're looking at human neutrophils. And if you have a really old school lab, like the one I used to work in, you actually made them yourself with neutrophils of staff members who could be conned into donating blood. And so what we see here is that you've got we look at whether or not they're staining through the cytoplasm or staining within the nuclear nucleus or around the perinuclear, and that will indicate potential different diseases. And then we have huge numbers of autoimmune, so liver diseases, and then other specific autoimmunities such as pernicious anemia, celiac disease, and autoimmune viral disease. So for one, one example, see that disease, which is a very big part of the caseload of any diagnostic immunology laboratory. So it is an also organ specific autoimmune disease for the intestinal tract. It has a genetic component. So it is LHLA associated. 95% of celiac patients express the HLA DQ2 protein and the other 5% will express HLA DQ8 protein. However, in areas where celiac disease is common, between 25 to 30% of the population will express HLA DQ8 or DQ2. So it is not, they still aren't sure entirely where the genetic link has lied. It is more common in people who are assigned female at birth, about twice as common as those who are assigned male. And there is a familial link. So there is a five to 15% of cases in people who have a close relative who is positive for celiac disease. It's most common in people with a Northern European background, where actually nearly 1% of the population will test positive for celiac disease. And unlike almost every other autoimmune disease that we have identified, we actually know the environmental trigger for celiac disease. So the environmental trigger is the alpha glidin, which is triggers atrophy of the small intestinal villi, as shown in the delightful biopsy. But, and this is part normally found in gluten, so wheat gluten, barley gluten, and oat gluten, or rye. Symptoms generally include, so CR disease is generally identified in childhood, where symptoms will include failure to thrive, fatigue, anemia, bloating and diarrhea, or generally down as a uh, consequence of the reduction in the villi. Laboratory diagnosis comes from the identification of three of the most common antibodies in the patient's serum. So we look for endomysial antibodies, tissues transglutaminase and gliadins. So we do these either by indirect immunofluorescence or ELISA. We're generally looking for IgA antibodies, although you can see celiac disease, which is IgG antibody mediated. Uh, it's one of my favorite immunofluorescences. So we use monkey esophagus tissue, and I would love to know who came up with this when they first designed the test. And you look for, as shown in the picture, what's known as chicken wire staining around the middle third of the esophagus. esophagus. Testing is not as with all immunology testing, it's only about 90% uh, accurate. So we would always follow up with a second test, which would then normally be an ELISA for one of the other common antibodies. The gold standard test for celiac disease is an endoscopy biopsy, but patients unsurprisingly don't like it. So, it is now possible to get a celiac diagnosis purely on the basis of the laboratory test, which has made many patients very happy. Because we know that there is an environmental trigger, treatment is lifelong avoidance of food containing gluten, uh, which has become much easier lately. 
And then one other major form of testing within diagnostic immunology is immunodeficiency. So most of our work is HIV, although we do a lot of primary immunodeficiency testing, uh, particularly Great Ormond Street, where we will get referred a huge number of pediatric patients with primary immunodeficiencies. But HIV is the most common cause of immunodeficiency. It infects CD4 positive T cells and at infection around 10% of individuals will develop acute illness. And then once seroconversion has occurred, you're unlikely to see much illness until CD4 levels have significantly decreased. This is one of the conditions that I find fascinating and one of the conditions that I always think is a really positive statement on how well laboratories work and how well they work together. So diagnosing HIV is a fairly long winded process, but it's a very important process. So we would start with a virology laboratory doing serology. So be looking for antibodies to either HIV one or HIV two. Once we will never diagnose HIV on the basis of one positive test. So there will always be a second follow-up test. Once we have two confirmed tests, we will then look at genotyping. So we work with the virology laboratory who will look at the different genotypes of HIV that a patient is currently infected with, and that will be used to develop their antiretroviral therapy. Patients will then be monitored with both HIV PCR and by flow cytometry. So we would look for the ratio of CD4 T cells compared to CD8 positive T cells. And that ratio and the decline of CD4 cells is used by clinicians in order to identify therapy and possibly start changing treatment of patients. And it's something I've always really enjoyed because when I was working in the immunology labs, you would see the same patients over and over again and you would actually become really quite attached to them, even though they actually had no idea who you are. So it was a slightly odd feeling. And I think that's it. So I'm aware that was a very quick run through but really what I just like to do with these sort of talks is show how important diagnostics is and actually how varied it is as an area. Thank you. That was lovely, thank you very much. It is really nice as someone who works in a research lab to kind of see what goes on on the other side. Um, unless you work in a tertiary care centre you're never really going to get that interaction with people who work in diagnostic labs despite a lot of the time you're doing some of the exact same stuff, <laughs> just in a different setting. <laughs> um, do you have, I'm going to, uh, I'm sorry, my cat <laughs> is jumping on the table. <laughs> Little bear, stop it. Um, one of the things I was going to ask is, um, do you have, any links to the apprenticeship stuff or career pathways on how to get into working in diagnostic labs that you could pass to us and we'll be able to link them around. So either those of us that are doing undergraduate lectures can pass them on to students and stuff. And yeah, my brain is. That's fine. So the best place <laughs> is the National School of Healthcare Science, okay. who I work for on the side because Perfect. we will take apprentices so we we actually take apprentices level two four and six and seven now so okay. it's with GCSEs A levels undergraduate degrees and postgraduate degrees which is quite cool fantastic and um, we do have a question from Faraz actually and he says thank you very much great chalk great talk <laughs> almost said chalk talk very eye-opening um, I have a question about how you've had to adapt things to the COVID period were certain tests slash patients prioritised and what's the strategy with having to shift whole operations very quickly? 
<laughs> so as because my work now is as depth uh, deputy scientist, I actually work across physiological sciences. So I don't work in pathology except for my PhD. But obviously, all that changed with COVID. So somebody leaned into my office and said, "Oh, you have a pathology background, don't you?" I'm like, yep. And I was given three weeks to set up and staff a SARS-CoV-2 testing lab in March. And we managed it and we have a we have a capacity of a thousand samples a day currently, and we which was really good. So we predominantly staffed with our wonderful research partners at UCL and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, who were generous enough to come over and volunteer had to run the PCR testing. Now, because of UK law, they couldn't release the PCR results. So they were only able to actually just run the assay. And then we had to recruit scientists from any lab who had experience in PCR to actually authorize the results and get them out to Public Health England by 9 a.m. the following morning. So that was a whole bundle of fun, but we've now recruited into those positions because the academics have gone back to their day, day jobs. And then from an antibody point of view, so I supported our immunology laboratory by in effect taking on a lot of the extra bits of research. So I helped validate or verify some of the rapid testing kits that were all over the news back in April that the government bought. And I've tested loads of those, which we then didn't use because the sensitivity was 42%. And then we, I helped validate some of the antibody testing kits. So most of it, we didn't, we didn't have to prioritize based on testing because most of that was done at a clinical level. And so if we had some labs which saw a reduction in work because the clinics seeing those patients were canceled. So we then just moved people around, but we have prepped for the second wave and the surge and the increase that we're seeing and the fact that we're now testing uh, frontline NHS staff twice a week. But that was done predominantly over the summer. So yeah, it's been, it's been a year. I've had, I think, 22 days off in 2020 so far. Gosh, no, it, it very much mirrors um, my best friend is one of the biomedical scientists at Glasgow Royal. And they're one of the COVID testing centers for Scotland. And she was like, we had five days to get the lab set up. And one of the amazing things is um, when they set up the testing centers at ARI, I was at Aberdeen at the time um, because the university research center is actually attached onto the pathology and laboratory services. So you just scan your card and you can walk directly from the medical research school straight into pathology. So we actually use a lot of the NHS's pathology labs as core facilities for our university. Oh. So they do all of our histology and stuff. Um, we gave them our entire QPCR core center. <laughs> the machines onto a trolley and walked all of our PCR machines into the NHS labs next door. And again, they, they did the same thing as well. So it's a, a mirrored experience, it seems, across much of the UK to bulk up testing. We did use UCL's extractor, um, which involved picking, putting all of our samples in a bag and walking them across the road. <laughs> it is one of those things that it is nice to see diagnostics and academia pulled together in a really difficult time. It hopefully utilised what we had available at the time in the middle of an emergency. So, yes. Yeah. Um, what I'll do is I will pass the links you've given me to Matt and we'll try and disseminate some of them more widely. Thank you so much for taking the time and coming to talk to us today. Thank you for everyone coming along. Matt, do you have the slide with who's speaking next week? Because again, I don't. <laughs> I am horribly organised, especially now I'm not working. Um, I don't have the slide to hand. <gasps> I know, I know. I oh no! In inverted commas, organised this whole thing, and then I'm not organised either. Um, but obviously that will be on uh, Twitter if you haven't already seen it. Um, I can actually wait, I can tell you who I, is talking. I found it. I um, found so it. next week, which is the 30th of November, got Mario Gaia. Um, who's talking on the innate regulation of B-cell immune 
immunity to pathogens and Brian Daniels who's talking about the protective roles for RIPK3 signaling in neuroinflammation and viral encephalitis. Whoa, that was a mouthful. <laughs> As anyone knows me, I've had very little sleep the last four days dealing with my visa, so <laughs> you'll all have to forgive me. Um, Matt has recorded these, so these will go up onto the YouTube channel at some point soon. Um, you will post the link on the STEM Village Twitter. And again, thank you very much for joining us today. I hope you all have a fantastic evening slash afternoon where you are, and we will see you all next week. Bye.